Our second scripture lesson is from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 13. Listen now for the word of God. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, Servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy One, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I used to think this day was called Monday Thursday. Am I the only one? Which, of course, makes no sense whatsoever, Monday, Thursday. But actually, it's called Maundy Thursday, which also makes no sense whatsoever until you realize the word Maundy comes from the Latin mandatum. I probably butchered that. It means command or an order. The Gospel reading for today recounts the Last Supper when Jesus had his final meal with his friends and how he got up from the table and he tied a towel around his waist and began to wash their feet. And then he gives them a new mandatum, a new commandment that we love. He commanded his followers to love as he loves. This is how everyone will know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. You know, I used to think that this command to love was a 
prerequisite for being Jesus' disciple. But Jesus here is saying no. It's actually the result of being his disciple. Because you see, the love Jesus commands us to share is not a, a greeting card kind of love. It's agape love. Agape one another, Jesus said. Not try and generate a fondness for the irritating, or not try and create warm feelings for the unlikable or the unlovely. Oh, Jesus knew better than to imply that if only we could muster up enough niceness, then we'd be up for the task of following him. No, this command, the love that we're commanded to share, has a source. And thankfully, it's not us. Because you know, there's been other commandments to love our neighbor before this night. But what makes this commandment a new commandment is that this love is the love of the Father for the Son. Agape love is not romance or friendship. It's the kind of love that God creates in us and provides for us to share. Because God desires for God's people to be loved. And I've been thinking about that all week and how simple it sounds, but how hard it is. Not the loving others part, although that's plenty hard because people can be difficult. No, the thing I've been thinking about all week is how hard it is to be loved, to receive it, to feel worthy of it. Sometimes it really is easier to give than to receive. And so I've been thinking about how Jesus received love. Last Sunday, we heard about Jesus' friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Kevin preached on Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. But Jesus went back there for a dinner party, you know, to Mary and Martha's house after he raised their brother Lazarus. It was actually just five days before this night when he was betrayed by his disciples whose feet he would have just washed. See, Mary and Martha and Lazarus hosted a dinner party for Jesus, a small gathering, I imagine, with good food, great wine, and amazing friends. You know, the kind of friends that, with whom Jesus could just relax. People who loved him, not for his work necessarily as a teacher and healer, but also for just being him, all of him. And there they were, lounging at the table, finishing off the last bit of hummus, when suddenly Mary is carrying a small jar of nard, a very costly perfume, one used to anoint the dead. She carried this jar over to her friend, Jesus. See, this friendship with her family was going to cost Jesus more than just his freedom. I mean, the authorities sought to arrest him after he raised Lazarus. After all, if they let him go on like that, everyone would believe in him and no one would believe in the authorities. So the drama was building up at this point. That night, Mary carried some perfume over to her friend Jesus, whom she loved so dearly. He loved them, but they also loved him. We don't really talk about that much, the way in which Jesus was loved. We speak of how he showed love, gave love, was love. But what about the way in which he received love? Mary removed the cork stopper from the jar and anointed his feet with perfume, knowing that he'd soon be killed. Everyone got really quiet as Mary washed his dusty feet and wiped them with her unbound hair, one foot at a time. I've wondered all week, how did Jesus receive this love? 
Was he like me, hesitant, suspicious, resistant? Was he needy, embarrassed? Did he try and get her to stop? Or did he receive this love with a heart that was open, knowing that it was what he needed to get through the last week of his life? I don't know. But I do know that five days later, he was reclining at the dinner table with his disciples, finishing off the last of the hummus when suddenly he carries a small basin of water over to Peter and the others and cradles the feet of his friends, and dries them gently with a towel, with the same love that he received from Mary, one foot at a time. Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber writes, this is our Lord's economy. We become what we receive. We know how this works, that hurt people hurt people, forgiven people forgive people, that loved people love people. But that doesn't make it any easier to have your feet washed. It doesn't make it any easier to receive love well. Because let's be honest, it's a little awkward to have people touch your feet, right? It's intimate. It's personal. We feel embarrassed about our feet. If you've ever taken part in a foot washing, you know the anxiety that is felt in this act. People are constantly apologizing for their feet. We don't want just anyone to see that bunion or hammer toe. We worry about our calloused heels and foot odor. So most of the time we keep our feet covered. To have our feet exposed, washed, or even touched by a stranger can be way too vulnerable. So I understand why, despite Jesus' admonition that his disciples wash one another's feet, that some churches have substituted it for the far less vulnerable hand washing or simply ignored it altogether. Like Peter, we recoil. No way, Lord, you will never wash my feet. Had Jesus commanded Peter to wash his feet, I suspect Peter would have done it gladly. But to receive it? To be loved is just harder somehow. I mean, it seems like it wouldn't be. I mean, love me for what I can do for you? Fine. Love me for my work? Okay. But love me, just me, all of me, everything that I am, good and bad? That's too much. Because it brings up all the ways that I don't feel worthy of it. It reminds me of all the ways that I've loved poorly or not at all. I'd rather earn love in some way because I was good or because it was reciprocal. But love without condition for all that I am, good and bad, it feels too vulnerable. You see, we don't like foot washing because we fear that our feet are repellent and ugly, somehow too much to be touched or held by another. But perhaps the underlying fear is that we are too repellent and ugly to be touched or held by another. Oh man, but the beautiful, terrible thing about Holy Week is that it won't let us pretend. And Jesus comes back with this strong statement, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, unless you are willing to receive love, then how can you give it? It's got to come from somewhere. And maybe it's by receiving it, by allowing ourselves to receive love, that's how we become loving. 
You see, receiving love or, or grace for that matter reminds us of all the conditions we haven't met in order con to consider ourselves worthy of that love. But the thing is, meeting the conditions of being worthy of love is our formula, not God's. What makes you worthy of both giving and receiving this agape love is simply that Jesus desires it for you. I mean, Jesus knew what was going to go down later that night. He kept telling them that he would be betrayed and denied and handed over to be killed. The feet he held in his hands that night, he knew what they were about to do. He knew them, good and bad. He still loved them. Love is... Judas slithers out the room. Love, as Peter will soon deny that he even knows who he is. Love that will torture him. Love as they crucify him. Love as his mama watches him die. Love when he breathes his last. And love when they put him in the tomb. And then three days later, love when the earth quakes. Love when the stone is rolled away. Love when he rises up and death itself is defeated. A love that forgives all things. A love that can carry us through the pain, a love that outlasts our sorrow, a love that calls us to receive it. You see, a sentimental version of love will not do. We're talking about a different kind of love, an unselfish love, a sacrificial love. We're talking about the self-giving love of God, which formed the foundations of the earth and then came and walked on that same earth. And tonight, Jesus is using his actual body to show us what that love is. When he gets up from the table, takes off his robe, and puts on a towel. One commentator says he leaves heaven, that's the table, puts aside his trappings of divinity, that's the robe, and takes human form, that's the towel. He pours out water to show how this divine love has been poured out for us. And he'll do it again tomorrow, this time pouring out blood to show us his love for the whole world. He's got the whole world in his hands. But tonight, tonight he holds your feet. Do you know what I've done for you? Jesus asks, I've wiped away all of your shame. I've wiped away all of your sin. And one day I will wipe away every tear from every eye. Do you know what I've done for you? What I will do for you? What I will never stop doing for you? Do you know what I've done for you? Jesus asks, I've set you an example. And the example becomes a command. Love. Love one another. Wash each other's feet. This is how everyone will know that you're my disciples, that you love. It's a command to be loving, yes, but it's a command to receive love as well. Outside, Jesus will love the whole world to death tomorrow. But tonight, in here, he loves you. Verse 3 tells us that Jesus knows that the Father had given all things into his hands. And it's in those hands he holds us, one foot, one foot at a time. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. So let us love one another. Let us become what we receive. Not because we're good, but because we're loved. Amen.